Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I'd like to start off by thanking the organizers for inviting me here this afternoon. Uh, I represent a company called Azuga Telematics. Uh, and uh, the, to, today, I'll be talking about how telematics can be used in urban analytics and different ways it can be applied to develop uh, you know, for city planning and for city management. Uh, I'll basically be sharing our experiences, and uh, you know, we'll uh, have a, probably a better discussion uh, later. Uh, Azuga is a five-year-old company. We are uh, headquartered in, San in California, and we are a wholly owned subsidiary of a Michigan-based company called Danlaw. Now, Danlaw is a, is a company that provides the hardware, and Azuga was set up to provide a software solution around this. Um, you might ask, what is telematics? Now, uh, Uber presented um, their uh, solution of using the, m the mobile phone to send data. Now, telematics is essentially that. It's sending data from remotely and communicating that elsewhere and to, and to make use of that data intelligently. Uh, what does it involve? It typically involves GPS tracking, but it now it's, it goes much beyond that. It involves uh, data coming from GPS uh, sensors. It uh, involves data coming from vehicle sensors, from uh, mobile phones, like we saw in the case of Uber, and also from uh, cameras, uh, dashboard cameras, as well as other uh, applications that can be built into the, into the vehicle. Um, how, does, how can telematics be used? Now, the data that we get itself is not our typical you know, data. It's, it's high volume data. We get data every second from a location. We get uh, data from an accelerometer, which can be one hundredth of a second. So these are large volumes of data that, you know, that needs to be processed differently. So it's basically convergence of telematics and big data analytics, and to, you know, to use that for different applications. What we see in our use cases are that it can be used effectively for safety, for collision detection, fuel economy, road user charging, and a few other aspects. I'll touch upon each one of these in our presentation. But th this is not exhaustive. This is just uh, uh, an overview of what we found to be useful. Uh, primarily, uh, telematics has been used for uh, safety. And that's going to be a prime focus uh, for telematics use cases, especially when we talk about commercial fleets. Uh, the context in India, we have about 150 road deaths every year. And uh, about 500,000 people are injured every year. Now, this can cost the, com uh, cost the country almost $58 billion annually. And that's almost about 3% of our GDP. So just focusing on safety can make a tremendous impact on, on our GDP. What are the factors or uh, what kinds of behaviors are associated with accidents? Uh, we've seen that it's essentially speeding, hard braking, distracted driving, hard acceleration, the use of seat belts, and also time of day driving. Uh, there are many research studies that have been carried out, mainly in the US, and these have shown that uh, speeding, for example, can contribute to almost 28% of all accidents. Uh, distracted driving is it's about 8%, but that's growing as more people begin to use their mobile phones. Uh, when we look at telematics, we are trying to assess driver behavior. So when we have a device that plugs into vehicles, we are monitoring driver behavior. And what we've seen is that we've built several accident models, and we've seen that braking behavior is one of the, the strongest predictors of an accident. One heartbreaking event per 100 miles can increase the risk of an accident by almost 36%. Speeding, likewise, for 10 minutes can increase your risk by 100%. Now, this is something that is not new. Insurance companies have been talking about this, and they, they, and they introduce these concepts in user-based insurance. Uh, what we are trying to do is try and influence such behavior, to try and reduce such risky behavior and, and reduce accidents. Now, telematics itself, uh, when we monitor such behavior, can provide real-time feedback. Uh, for example, you can set a threshold on the OBD device. Uh, our device is a green device that you see there. This plugs into the OBD port of a vehicle. Now, the OBD port gets its data from the vehicle's ECU, so it's very accurate data. We get data on different aspects of, of, of speed, uh, vehicle health, and so on. But for driver behavior, we essentially focus on, on speeding. 
with uh, excessive speeds, uh, when you cross a certain threshold, we are able to set a th a the device to buzz. And that real-time feedback can influence driving behavior. Well, we've seen through our data that about there's a 21% reduction in speeding just by giving feedback to drivers on speeding. Likewise, for braking and acceleration, there's an 85% reduction. So just the fact that you provide real, real feedback to drivers can influence driving behavior. Uh, I mentioned uh, distracted driving can also uh, be a significant factor in accidents. What we can do is to tie, tie in with the, uh, with the phone through Bluetooth pairing and either disable the phone or, or at least monitor driving behavior. Now this is again proven to be quite effective. We've seen a lot of accidents reduced as a result of, uh, of such disabling uh, of the phone. The, the, I mentioned that the a camera can also be integrated into telematics devices. We, uh, we have a camera which is integrated. We, uh, at this point, we just provide a snippet, a five second snippet before and 10 second post a particular event. Now this is useful for, again, you know, to, as evidence for any uh, eventuality. But what it can also do is to provide uh, advanced driver assistance uh, for, uh, for, for drivers. For example, it could read traffic signs and recognize the speed limits on roads and then prompt the driver as to whether he's driving safely or not. It can also look at collision warning by looking at the distances in front of the vehicle and provide adequate warning for, to, uh, for the driver to take uh, evasive action. It, it can also look at lane departure, and in some cases where we have a forward-facing camera, we can look at distracted driving, um, and also in terms of fatigue driving. Now, this could be in terms of uh, you know, the camera sensing the iris of, uh, you know, of the driver, or looking at whether the person's moving away, or looking away from the front of the road. Uh, lane warning and collision warning, all these are things built into advanced uh, or autonomous drivers, uh, autonomous vehicles right now, we're trying to look at this as a kind of a retrofit for vehicles, if you will. Uh, we also try and look at historic data. Now, when we get data on a person's driving behavior, we look at his past patterns of driving. And what we do is to try and look for predictive uh, measures. Can we look at patterns that can predict certain behavior? If a person, if a driver tends to be speeding on a particular day, you know, on a particular uh, stretch of road, and we see such repeated behavior, can we predict with a certain level of confidence that that's going to happen the next time he's been on that road or he's driving at that point in time? Uh, by looking at such predictive analytics, what we're trying to do is to try and preempt such behavior, send notifications to drivers, tell them in advance to be a little more careful and to try and influence such driving behavior. Um, we also start looking, we use, we have an accelerometer which is built into our device and what we try and do is to try and look for crash detection. If a vehicle's been involved in an accident, we try and see if there's a certain signature that could point to an accident. Now, this could really help in terms of emergency response. When an accident is believed to have uh, occurred, we would like to send a notification, uh, either to uh, you know, an ambulance or it could be for, to anyone who's supposed to be notified, and so that ad appropriate action can be taken and taken quickly. But again, we have to be a little careful. We can't just trigger uh, an, an accident when you've gone over a large pothole. So we have to be a little bit more intelligent uh, when, when discriminating between a real crash and a, and a false positive. So that's where you know, we're trying to build more intelligence. We're trying to build these classification algorithms and, uh, and make this more watertight. Uh, the accelerometer data can also be used for accident reconstruction. Now, again, this, could be, this is mainly used for insurance, where you're trying to see who was at fault. Uh, and that could be indicated through different parameters, like the principal direction of force, the point of impact, area of impact, and so on. What this can also do is to try and look, uh, it can try and help with predictive injury estimates. Now, if you have a certain level, a certain g-force, that could point to you know, it could either be a minor crash, it could be a major crash, and we could then try and predict what is the level of injury. Could, is it a fatal accident, or what is the probability that it's a fatal accident, or, what, or is it just a minor crash? There are a lot of uh, whiplash injuries. Again, we see that in the US, and these are uh, falsely claimed by insurance companies. Now, this kind of data can really help support and provide evidence for that. Um, 
we also use the accelerometer for road, uh, road type classification. We have carried out some uh, studies in the US and we've been able to use the accelerometer to classify roads as good, moderate, and poor. Now, again, this can be used by planning agencies to prioritize investments by identifying areas which have poor quality of roads. And if there's a high volume of movement in that particular area, uh, city planners can take action to, you know, to look and remedy that particular uh, situation. Uh, we get a good uh, amount of fuel data. Now, since our device plugs into the vehicle, we get fuel consumption at a very granular level. At the end of each trip, we know the amount of fuel consumed. And we are able to use this data to build kind of models for either baselining or benchmarking fuel efficiency. One of the things we've done is to look at uh, benchmarking make model uh, fuel consumption by make model year, and not just in terms of the make of the model, but also region specific and season specific models. So at using these models, we are able to predict what is the expected fuel consumption given that it's a certain region in the, uh, that we've built a model for and, the certain, and a certain season. If we then are to compare that expected value with what we get, we can see if the vehicle's underperforming or not, and also look at it in terms of whether it's either caused by poor driving behavior or whether it's a po possible fault with the vehicle. Now this is, again, this can be used by regulators. Uh, we, in India, we have mass emission standards uh, for, uh, and fuel, uh, fuel, uh, 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 fuel economy standards, but what we can really do is to help these regulators compare such the performance of these make model years. Uh, we also start, look at, uh, start looking at driving behavior and how this correlates with fuel consumption. We have a lot of anecdotal evidence that certain types of behavior, you speed a lot, you brake a lot, you, it would increase fuel consumption. But is there real evidence for that? That's where we've looked at data from millions of trips and built these correlation models. And what we see is that braking events you know, increase fuel consumption by 0 0.043 gallons. Speeding for one minute increases fuel consumption by 0 0.013 gallons and so on. Now this, these models are being used by some of our customers to improve and to change driver behavior. So not only do you save on fuel, but you also reduce risk by improving or reducing such behaviors. Uh, so far, we've been looking at driver behavior in terms of safety and in terms of uh, fuel efficiency. Uh, we also can use telematics in terms of taxation. Now, there are three states in the US, Oregon, California, and Colorado, which have piloted road usage charging. Uh, although it's termed as fair taxation of road usage, it's, it's, it's essentially driven by other factors. In, in the US, uh, typically, you know, the fuel that you pay for, or uh, the, the fuel, uh, there's, there's a uh, gas tax that's associated with that, which is uh, meant for uh, road maintenance. But with more energy efficient vehicles uh, and more, more uh, hybrid vehicles uh, and, and, and a more uh, fuel efficient fleet coming in, the amount of uh, taxes generated has actually reduced. So governments, local governments are finding it hard to maintain roads. So they've tried to pilot road user charging using telematics. Uh, this uses a GPS device. It uh, tries to look at the miles that you drive, and then it, and it charges that particular vehicle based on the miles that's been driven on in that particular state. Uh, we've also been looking at remote emissions monitoring. Uh, I mentioned that our device connects into the OBD port of the vehicle. So we get a lot of DTC events. We get a lot of uh, PID information from vehicles. This is, uh, you know, your uh, different uh, kinds of uh, faults that lie within the vehicle. And that can be sent to the Department of Environmental Quality. They carry out a test remotely and see whether that particular vehicle is likely to have passed or failed an emissions test. Now, this is, again, piloted in Oregon, and other states are considering this as well. So just to summarize, uh, there is a tremendous opportunity for using telematics, for s not just for safety and fuel economy, but there are other opportunities as well, uh, especially for road infrastructure improvements, for in terms of classification mapping, like I uh, showed you, uh, taxation, emissions monitoring, and also for toll usage. Uh, there are also other benefits that we see in terms of uh, route optimization and vehicle health, which I haven't touched upon here, but there are tremendous benefits here. 
Uh, in India especially, this is something new, it, it's, but it's hard to really break into the market because of cost. And what we are trying to do is to try and work with insurance companies. Because once we have insurance companies on board, the, the, the data that we get from that can be shored, uh, shared among different stakeholders. And it can benefit not just uh, insurance companies, but uh, cities as well as uh, you know, other uh, um, government agencies. So with that, I'll uh, end my presentation, and uh, I'll be happy to chat at the end of the session.